Welcome back, post the refreshment break. We have a panel discussion lined up for you. And I'm going to be introducing the moderator to take the panel discussion forward. May I please request and invite Mr. Ankit Sahu, co-founder and director, Objectify Technologies Private Limited. Let's welcome him, please. He's going to be introducing the panelists and also taking the session forward. So I'd like to leave it to the expertise of Mr. Sahu. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for the introduction. So I wanted to introduce my panel first, and then we will start about the discussion on the topic of becoming the global leaders in uh, tooling. So I would like to invite Mr. Ashim Sharma, uh, senior Partner and Group Head, Business Performance in Improvement Consulting from Namura Research Institute. I would like to also invite Dr. Uh, Mr. M.M. M. Singh, Director and CEO, uh, International Automobile Center of Excellence and Ex Executive Advisor to Maruti Suzuki India. I would like to invite Mr. D. Ravi, Managing Director, CM Precision and Products. Uh, I would also invite Mr. Vivek Nani Vadikar, uh, Executive Director, Fibro India Precision Products Limited. Thank you, my panel, for the today's talk. And uh, just the thought over uh, talking about becoming anything global and becoming anything going be up and beyond. As uh, in today's keynote, a lot of people had talked about benchmarking other countries, uh, talking about other countries. But India also possesses its own benefits and merits. It's all about the psychology of doing things differently and taking things in a strife. So in 1980s and 1990s, India and China were quite a parallel kind of economy. But India took another route, and China evolved as a different ma manufacturing behemoth. So this, this actually brings to us uh, as an opportunity in the current circumstances, geopolitical, uh, certain climate change issues, certain uh, demographic uh, opportunity is what India has. And uh, I would like my panel to introduce themselves on the thought of talking about uh, India as a tooling head. So Mr. M. M. Singh, I would re really like you to. Good morning. And I am really thankful, uh, Agma, for giving me this opportunity to come and uh, put my thought. But I am not a tooling man. I think uh, my whole uh, four decades of journeys in manufacturing, and especially in the automotive manufacturing. I started my journey from t t uh, Telco, which is presently Tata Motors. And from last almost, you can say, from last almost 40 years, I'm still continuing Maruti. If I look at uh, manufacturing as a whole, because, you know, because started also, I was just thinking, uh, because the technology is changing, the things are changing very fast. But uh, looking at the overall scenario and coming time when we are talking about to be really become a global, and when I think our prime minister is also again and again trying to put the force that we should be global India or make in India, quality India, all these things are also coming up very fast and very candid. I think he's talking about again and again. But as a country, you look at what is happening. I'll just give you a very different type of perspective. Maybe some of you may agree, may not agree, but I can tell you the ground reality of what is happening today. Uh, if I talk about journey of last 40 years, yes, there is a change and change is visible. I think uh, when I talk about before 80s, after 80s, when Maruti came and the where the things have started going to a different direction and all the, all the technology and uh, we started with the manual systems, manual lines and gradually how the technology has evolved, in the, evolved with the time. And where we are Marathi today, I think you all are aware that 100% automation going for all the latest technology and all. But uh, another part, it is happening with all the big players. I'm talking big players means having a very good turnout and also they have a muscles. 
But uh, my major concern when I look at industry as a whole, because when I'm talking here, it is also my prime duty that I, I try to give you a different perspective altogether, because if you look at, uh, particularly I'm talking about MSMEs, where we have 80, 85% strength. Each the change is taking place there also, maybe very few. And uh, I'll tell you my own experience of last almost uh, five or six years, particularly I can tell you because I have worked very closely with more than 800 uh, MSMEs you can talk about. Very closely I have tried to work with them, I try to understand what is their major concern, where the things are involved. And that is a concern to me. Actually when we are talking about going for a digital India or going for a digital manufacturing and all, but the ground reality is totally different. I think a lot of efforts are required from we all. And there, I think I want to give you a call, because thin and until we are not going to take them along, whatever we talk about, things are not going to change. Because what is happening today, you know, maybe at the OEM level, maybe at a uh, tier one level, things are working, because we have many uh, filter mechanism where the things are, maybe at the end of the day, you are making, making a good product, you are getting a good product. But till and until from this inception stage, if you are not able to control the consistency and the quality of the product, I think things are not going to work for us. What is required here? Because just I, uh, because if I talk about myself, you know, because when I was heading manufacturing in Maruti for almost more than 10 years, I was heading and uh, I had the opportunity and I'm really thankful, the innovation, the technology that has invived and the way we have changed. We have changed a lot. I tell you probably, if I uh, start looking at my own success story in Maruti, I think you people are responsible for that. Because still I recall somewhere in 2003 and 4 when I took the charge of production, the way the, our machining areas and casting and all those were there. But when I had a close interaction with you people, and then the way you have given me the innovative idea, the way you have given me the tools, and the uh, totally different type of mechanism where you were told me, Singsha, please apply this, and you are going to have a tremendous improvement in overall. And where Marty is today, I think you people have contributed a lot on that. There is, I don't have any hitch to say that because that was one of the major, major, major bottleneck that time. But what is happening to them? You know, the concern is if you are not going to approach them, because once they are required one or two tools, when many times I go and see the way that they are using the toolings and all, I think it's still not up to the date. How, what type of platform, platform, where the platforms can be created, where really we can work together, you know, because till and until we are not addressing that issue, things are not going to work for us. So what is required is, I'll, because what I am heading presently, I'll tell you the concept of our Prime Minister, I think he is a totally different level person, because I think his vision is very clear. When Maruti came in, uh, uh, we went to Gujarat, he told me one thing, because we, uh, when we signed the agreement with Gujarat government, that time he was the chief minister, he told me only one aspect. Can we make something where we can develop the manufacturing culture, autom automotive culture in Gujarat? And he told me, can we make a world-class center? And I'm heading presently from last, uh, you can say almost now, the say seven or eight years of heading that uh, center. And if the purpose is what I have talked about just now. That is our main purpose. Purpose is to see how we can create a platform where you are there and the actual user is there. And they may be a very small, but cumulatively you can be a very big player. Or your, your business will be there and they will also get the technology. Similarly, we are going for the skilling, you know, because the skilling are there. We, we have a lot of concern about the engineering skills are concerned, professional skills are concerned in the country. A center like us, what we are trying to do? Develop that skill also. So that together we can see that what the, we are dreaming of in coming five years, 10 years, center like what we have made, and I wish some of you, if you want, you please visit and see the global. It is a truly global center. You will be amazed to see the way it has been made with all the reviving, all the latest technology, and so that at least together we can see how the industry will come up. So I'll summarize, opportunities are going to be there. Opportunities are there with all the innovation and technology upgradation that you people are doing it. If really we can work together and see how really those masses can also be improved. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your thought on uh, manufacturing in India. Uh, Asim, sir, I uh, just want to understand from your thought on certain numbers because people misunderstand statistics in a different way. I think uh, during the COVID, everybody sitting here might be a statistician watching like the numbers go up and down. So, but in terms of manufacturing, how does India stand in the global perspective? And what is the difference currently India can play in the manufacturing role? Sure, thank you. Uh, 
I think since you talk about numbers, so clearly we are about two and a half percent of the total tooling market, right? So clearly looking at that, the potential is 40 times right, uh, of what we are doing. Also, another thing is we are the only tooling market in the world which is in the top five automotive markets, but not in the top five tooling markets. All the others that are the top four or five uh, automotive uh, con uh, manufacturing countries are also amongst the top four or five tooling manufacturing exactly. countries, right? So that is where there we see a big gap and probably an anomaly that despite we being very strong in automotive, being very strong in manufacturing, we've not been able to bridge this gap on tooling. Right? Now to look at it from this perspective, we see that definitely because a lot of manufacturing is happening in the country, the government is saying that this will increase many fold Recently, uh, one of the ministers said that the output of automotive in the country will almost double from 7.5 lakh crores to about 15 lakh crores by 2030. Even if it's not the exact figure, but somewhere close to it, certainly there is a lot of room to grow. Right? So th therefore, the potential or the opportunity is very much there. It is also backed up by the fact that car penetration is lower, right? so the motorization will increase, which will also cause a lot of uh, you know, demand for tooling, and the automotive industry also exports are picking up, and they are expected to pick up even more. India is, wa was, is, and shall become more and more critical in the automotive development value chain. Uh, so that will also mean more and more tooling coming here, life cycles are reducing. That also again creates the opportunity. But then the point is how do we meet preparedness for this opportunity, wherein we need to look at two or three clear factors there. Uh, one is what the government can do. Yes, they can provide some incentives and uh, some uh, you know, lower interest loans, et cetera, that is there. The OEMs can handhold some of the MSMEs because you know, they also benefit if all this is localized, given how the volatility in the supply chains is today, that is even more paramount to kind of localize all of this. The third thing which is there is how the global tool rooms and the Indian tool rooms come together. The global tool rooms get all the access for this market and bring the technology. And the Indian tool rooms get that technology, hence can improve their quality and all of that. Finally and very importantly is what tool rooms or the MSMEs can do amongst themselves is to cooperate, form consortiums, because each on its own will not be able to invest the amounts that are needed, for example, to crunch on time, to improve on quality, but together that would be possible. Second, also look at not doing everything in-house, but outsourcing things. So like, you know, a tiered value chain, like countries like Taiwan has done, or the Jap Japanese Kiretsu system does, uh, that would be second. And third is also probably bidding for some of the projects together and doing it. So with all of these four factors taken into account, perhaps we can, you know, meet, have the preparedness to meet this opportunity that's out there. So can we say that there is a specific roadmap or something we can copy from the other side of the global perspective or do we need to develop it from our end? I wouldn't say copy. I would say we look at what's happening, understand the best practice, then apply it in our context. For example, say Taiwan can have very close-knit clusters, but India is a you know, much bigger country, so we need to think about it that way. They could have export-oriented clusters, we could have the clusters even supporting domestic. So I'm saying look at the best practices, look at the context and try to apply them here. That would be sort of the most prudent thing to do. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Ravi sir, I wanted to ask you, like, is a international customer's behavior same as the Indian OEM or an international supplier's uh, way of working with the Indian OEM is same as the other way around, like, do you see there is a same way the Indian OEM behaves with an Indian tool room uh, to an international tool room or the vice versa? You sell outside India also, you sell within India also. How do you see the change, the perspe perspective of purchasing from an Indian tool room to an international tool room? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you and good morning to all. Uh, I'm Ravi. Um, I have about 40 years of tooling uh, experience. Uh, so 48 years working. I spent 32 years of uh, business experience. I have uh, three units in uh, uh, Chennai into plastic molds, uh, sheet metal toolings, die castings, and forgings. Um, see, what I would say is, having been in this tooling industry for the more, more than uh, three decades and a manufacturing experience, 
Um, it's definitely from whatever, like the morning speech Mr. Kakar has told, and also like Mr. Ashi told about the, um, we are not the top five uh, tool makers, but we are the top five for automotive makers. And uh, the Indian tooling industry is now in a uh, start, I would say in a beginning stage. Our first success, I would say, from the morning meeting, from the same Mr. Kaka, about four or five years back when he came for the tooling industry, he said that India, Indian tool rooms are yet to rise to the occasion. But today I'm happy to hear that he told that 90% of the tooling they are trying to source from India. That itself is, I would say, is the first big success. That is, in the tooling industry, we are trying to uh, avoid, reduce the import substitution, avoid the imports. So that itself is the first step. Now we have to move into the next step of exports. So that is a major uh, thing. The main point is that most of the Indian tool rooms are entrepreneur driven. Mostly they are all technocrats. Um, so they started in a small level. And when it comes to up to 50, 20 crores, the tool there, it's become easy to manage. Beyond that, the scalability is something which is a very key challenge at present. Like what it's been morning also, the, uh, the chief guest spoke about the scalability. Scalability is the big challenge we have uh, in our presently. The size of infrastructure, network, and the manpower, skilled people to handle that kind of a volume of business is something uh, ahead of us that we need to sit together how to manage it. As for the, your question of handling the customers, customers are industry, in, uh, domestic or international, the customers are same. But only thing is, we, from our side, First, first, we have to set ourselves improve a lot on certain areas like uh, communications. That, that is important thing which we need to improve. We are particularly when you do with the overseas, then the in, in, uh, Indian uh, domestic customers, the communication is the key, and uh, the speed at which we respond also makes a big change. Sure, sure. So, coming to a thought on like uh, during the pandemic, how have you seen the industry? coping up with the pandemic itself, like how you have seen the OEM, the tier ones, the tool makers, everybody has fared during the pandemic, how you have seen the industry as a whole? Yeah, maybe uh, it would be difficult to bring it in a common thing. Each industry has its own peculiar or uh, different uh, experience of their own. But uh, like, you know, uh, necessity, the mother of invention, and uh, the, this crisis definitely brought the and uh, think best out of us. Everyone is trying to see what best to keep us floating or be stay above the waters. So, and the uh, good thing is that we are all here today. Itself is a big success that we are all able to sail through those tough times. And that made us much more stronger and ready to face the challenge in the coming days. And now it's good to know that the India is poised to be the manufacturing capital of the world. So the next coming uh, five, 10 years is, seems to be quite bright and encouraging. It's up to us how much we can uh, take the opportunities. Sure, sir. So Vivek, sir, uh, I wanted from an MNC perspective and uh, for a tooling solution, you must have seen there is an evolution in the Indian customer ask, the thought process of the tool maker, the thought processes of the end user. So how have you seen that as an evolution in the Indian context? Uh, first of all, thank you, Tagma, for giving me this opportunity to express uh, my views. Uh, Fibro has been in India since 2008. Okay. And uh, if you observe from 2008 till today, the tool makers were not used to using of standard parts. The slowly the awareness has increased and people, customer, the tool makers have started using standard parts. Still, it is only limited to the first year and second year vendor we have to still further go down. That would really help us uh, uh, to reduce the uh, lead time. That is one. Secondly, looking at the, the market demand and uh, uh, the customer's uh, uh, suggestions, we are the first one to start manufacturing the aerial or uh, die-mounted cam units in India first. Because till recently, 100% people were importing those. So the make in India or Atma Nirbhar Bharat, we are definitely uh, contributing to it. Secondly, uh, we are part of a Laplay group. And uh, Laplay is very well known for uh, the first year vendor of the all premium European uh, brands. Now, uh, Laplay has also uh, are looking at the Indian tool makers 
for supply of toolings to them. So we are talking to a couple of, I mean, uh, tool makers for that. So this is how our the top management in Germany looking at it, India. And we are here, we are not a fly-by-night operators. We are here to stay. And we are, will be serving the uh, Indian industry and contributing towards more Atmanirbhar Bharat. Sure, sure. Uh, Mr. Asin, uh, I just wanted, like, your thoughts on two factors. Like, in the first term of our Prime Minister, he started with the Make in India thought process. And in the second half, during the COVID, it changed into Atmanirbhar Bharat. So are we missing an opportunity for an export level work because we, are, we might be closing our imports for the other countries and everywhere around the world it, the same kind of uh, effect is happening, S take America makes or take the British or the European way of thinking. So is India being have, having a mixed thought process on uh, Make in India and Atmanirbhar Bharat being uh, two sides of the same coin? Right. So I think yeah, to, to uh, answer one part of your question, is this happening globally? Yes, I think protectionism of industry is a global phenomena. It started off a couple of years ago, and it's here to stay, perhaps. Uh, also, sort of the world had two axes. There was one, the axis where China produced, US consumed, and that is kind of broken. The other was the world inflation was controlled because Russia would give cheap energy to Europe. That is also broken. So, you know, those things are happening, and geopolitics, and therefore the whole even the, uh, you know, sort of uh, protectionism is also going up. Uh, but coming to the India uh, thing about first talking about making India and then self-reliance, I think, yeah, uh, bo with both of these, I don't think this is at odds with saying that, you know, we won't export because there is also the PLI scheme, uh, you know, which, which is also looking at exports. At the same time, while we say we will make it in-house, Right? And you are being encouraged to make it in-house. Uh, is But it's not like, you know, there are being, uh, you know, the, that imports have been banned or something like that, right? So it, it is more about incentivizing people to do it here. And it makes sense for several of those things so that, you know, the employment benefits also come into the country at a larger scale. Uh, and not just, you know, everything coming from outside, you're doing final assembly here. Uh, so across across the value chain, uh, that thing coming in. Uh, I, do, I don't see that as being at odds with, you know, uh, us, uh, us emerging as, say, also export hub or getting integrated in the global value chains. You know, because going back to what I was saying earlier also, being amongst the top five well, vehicle makers in the world and not being amongst the top five tool makers in a, is an anomaly in India's case. Right? So if we can sort that out, the other markets which are top five in both are well integrated in the global uh, value chain for automotive. So why not for India also, even if we do that? So I don't think you know, our, our quest towards making more and more within the country is at odds with us becoming an integral part of global value chains. I see that as and. Yeah, so doing this so that we can also become an integral part of global value chains. Sure, sure. Um, uh, Singh Sen, uh, just wanted to think about like during the COVID times, all of a sudden there were so many mass manufacturers coming in India, there were so many other special equipment suppliers coming in India and it propped up like in days, in months kind of a thing and we became really self-reliant and we had to open up to export because it was so much. So are we still trying to figure out that skill problem in the country or we have enough skill and we are not able to manage that skill level uh, for, for taking the country for the global scale? No, I don't think so because, uh, you know, uh, when there was a crisis and overall if you look at scenario of skilling in India, practically what is happening, uh, the infra of that level is not available still. And till and until we are not able to develop that infra, things are not going to work for us. And that is the key challenge here because uh, even uh, I had the opportunity to go to the different state also see what they are doing because uh, if two things are going to be very critical here, one thing is yes, we should develop the infra of the skilling in such a way that it should be 100% employable and durable from day one because that is going to be very critical here. You know, because uh, let's suppose if I'm getting a diploma engineers or a degree holder and uh, they are fresh from the college and uh, if I'm able to give them some uh, understanding on the particular subject for maybe a few months or maybe a few weeks, 
and make them industry ready because that is going to be very critical for the industry you know because when this type of crisis occurs you no know, because then you don't have time neither you have people who are going to train them and tell them what is how it is to be done so what is required is requisite whatever the skills are required if let's suppose i am able to develop the infrastructure to that level so that and second part where i think uh, a lot of emphasis is going on nowadays is to where i think really i'm thankful to gujarat government particularly and I, overall i think that is a again the guideline from the central government what is happening today is uh, a lot of emphasis on going for uh, looking at the root because the root is and i'll be say you'll be surprised because uh, uh, some, some one month back we had a visit of almost all the education ministers from all the states and also the central government education minister came to our center in gujarat and he there there was a lot of deliberation was going can we give something in the school area because there were there was also there was a talk that can we look at from the school itself then the people are the children are there in the school or they are ideas or maybe diploma in the colleges how really we can imbibe those skilling from the beginning that whenever let's suppose in the future also and crises are going to come you know because that some day something is bound to happen so really the looking at overall scenario i think uh, two aspect what I, uh, where i think government is focusing today is train the trainers because this is one very critical year where there a lot of shortages are taking place in india is you have not adequate trainers in the country and uh, a center like us again i repeat because our major job also that has been given by the uh, ns uh, the nsid is said that, that we should try to train the trainers also because uh, if let's suppose the concept is clear the person who is giving the knowledge the person who is imbibing the law if they he is clear about what is required the industry requires is and if that can be given things are going to work for us overall i think we are moving the and uh, one uh, atmanirbhar bharat and all he is talking naturally the roots has to be built up and i think that way we are moving the right direction so that will be taken care sure sir thank you yes sir so ravi sir uh, talking about china and talking about india are we having like a a competition with, with with a mountain or are we going to reach somewhere there in some due course of time like how do you see as a tool maker as a competition yeah um, for uh, for everything not only for the mold making any product there is a china is a competition for any product take it so that's what whenever even customer comes and says the uh, cost of a mold in china is cheaper and uh, you are not able to do it i say it's not only the cost of the mold the product made out of the mold or even the end product everything is cheaper in china than in india so that is i don't know whether it's a right argument to put it uh, it's not only the mold it is a comparison between china and india any product for that matter the only difference i am seeing is the scalability with which they have grown and where we are yet to grow that was the difference see for example even taking the ashim's uh, word of you know why we are not in the top 5 uh, tool making see if I, if we introspect ourselves you see the top 10 are a, the, um, the the total number of tool rooms in india tool manufacturing companies in india how many companies are more than 100 crores i say it may not be it may be a few single uh, double digit it be not even it may not even cross 20 25 numbers i believe see that is a big, big key see in automotive the top five may be in some thousands of crores but whereas in the tool room the top 10 tool rooms not be on cross uh, 100 crores see if that is a case the tool room is not to be seen as a business if somebody is going to start a tool room in a business perspective definitely it may not be uh, it may not be interested in doing it because this is not the way it's a hard earned money it's not going to come easy compared to other business in uh, comparing to the mass production or production Uh, with li- less of a uh, involvement or department you can able to make a multiple turnover than what you do as a tool maker tool making is more of a passion and it's a craftsman it's a skill a person does it with his uh, involvement see that is one of the reason what many times that um, if we see look back our tool rooms many people the succession unless you see it, they grow it from scratch to 20 30 crores or 40 crores by the time they get old and then the next succession is not there you see many tool rooms also have a they say like a escrow it starts from somewhere it goes up and then it has its own downfall see if the s curve was to continue mean then another s curve has to take it up from there for that a succession is very important second level and this is some special support see unlike in other countries like what we say i, I heard japanese and um, japan and um, germany two room is treated more as a mother industry so that kind of a priority whereas unfortunately that is not been uh, there in this country now only there is a certain 
for which we need to have the parent industries, like OEMs and T1 should adapt. See, for example, some company comes to me and says that your product is not as good as an American product, US product, German product. Maybe that company is doing that product for the last decade. You would have made hundreds of molds or thousands of molds, and he compares my product of musk mold with that. Definitely, it's like I'm comparing an LKG student with an LKG postgraduate student. That's not an even comparison. So it should be, see, for which the Indian you know, OEMs and should hand carry. It's like, no, you are, we are now, India doesn't win any gold medal in the Olympics. What happened recently? There's a lot of people being trained from scratch. They've been trained, groomed up, identified, and created, and see, you start seeing the results. Now the people winning long jump, javelin throw, everybody, because they have been trained, they've been patronized. Like that hand-holding is needed for this industry by the OEMs and tier ones, if they want to, rather than looking down and pushing you, saying that you are not good as imported or other countries, definitely it's going to be a real struggle. Even the people who does it also lose it at a point and say they, they may give up. That's my humble submission. Sure, sir. Yes, yes, sir. I like uh, just because uh, support system that he was talking about. I, I just want to add one of uh, my interaction with uh, Secretary uh, MS Images and uh, in Delhi uh, some maybe few few months back, and uh, the same thing. But uh, I think he was talking about. He was also raising the same concern that uh, tool room viability and how really tool room can be world class and all the things he was talking about. And then one idea that he was throwing to me, Mr. Singh, can we really think of that? Uh, 20 makers can join hand together and with all uh, the, with one major player and they were ready. He was telling, you tell me anywhere, any place in the India, I like to open the center. I'll give you all the supports. Your contribution is 20%, rest 80%, we are going to give it from our side. I think somewhere, I think uh, 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 that realization is there in the central government also. But only thing is, yes, we have to take a call together that what type of systems are uh, going to be really applicable to us and how really it is going to be beneficial to the industry. If we, re we are on board, I think things are going to be taken care of. Thank sure, you. sir. Sure, sir. Yes. Uh, recently, there has been a lot of changes in the China also. Government is uh, withdrawing the subsidies on the material. And uh, as a result, we are becoming more and more competitive. I mean, for example, I will tell you, uh, today my exports to China is higher than my imports from China. Okay. Because we are, there are many low-cost standard parts manufacturers are in China. Okay. But over a period of time, one understands the importance of the quality, and then they prefer to use the quality products. So that is how we have to uh, I mean, start. So on, on that thought, how as an MNC, Make in India for you has been pushing along, like uh, thinking on making in India for the Indian consumers? Right. Okay. Uh, whatever we are making in Fibro India, we are making for the world. It is not only for domestic or it is not only for the export. Rather, we do not differentiate. The same product which uh, uh, goes to the Indian customer, same product goes to the uh, my European uh, my subsidiary also. So, we also have a, uh, a small manufacturing unit in China, but it is only for the Chinese market. They don't supply. Whereas the, the products made in India, Pivro India, they are made for the world. So, as I uh, just mentioned, uh, so it's not the only Pivro. The whole group, top management, is looking at India very positively. Everybody since inaugural, I mean, we are seeing everybody is talking about a potential. There is a definitely great potential. Everybody talked about the, the, the drawbacks also where we need upskilling of, uh, of the uh, uh, tool makers. So with this, if we have to, uh, now what I'm going to, we have to really start running fast. We can't be walking one by one. We have to really take a long leap to compete. Whether we compete with China or not, that is a different because that equations are different at any given time, even though China economy, uh, GDP growth is lesser than China, still it will be five to six times larger market in absolute term than exactly. India. Yes. So let us not compete with China, let us not get into that uh, statistics. But if we look at, if we compete with ourselves and we grow, then there is also definitely a much uh, uh, higher uh, chances for the growth. Sure, sure. So, uh, 
Mr. Asim, uh, just I will then after that uh, you can also think on uh, giving the closing comments and we will take it around. Uh, seeing the semiconductor crisis in India and seeing most of the talk has been on the automotive side and I think uh, Lava's uh, uh, founder was also speaking like India is too much on the tooling side, very much reliant on uh, the automotive. But still, like semiconductor is the backbone of any of the, and we have seen it uh, during this time. So coming out with a semiconductor policy in India, is it an active thought or a reactive thought, firstly? Then secondly, we don't have a semiconductor plant in India at all. And uh, so, so thinking on something like that as a necessity and reacting to it, is it like, because it cannot be done like one year you can uh, install a factory and you can start producing so much of semiconductor. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of skill. So what are your thoughts on having an active thoughts and reactive thoughts on to these kind of activities? Sure, I think semiconductor, which is sort of flavor of the season, the shortage for the last several months. Uh, I don't think just India, I think it was reactive for the whole world because everybody got that thing and semiconductors are not made in many parts of the world. So I don't think we were alone in thinking about it. The whole world was shell-shocked suddenly that these have become in short supply and the reasons are many, you know, the delaying the orders, not keeping enough inventory, the road nodes uh, sort of technology evolving, so you need sort of older ones for automotive, more high-tech ones for consumer electronics, so on and so forth, right? So I, I don't think we are alone in that to react. The whole world was kind of reactive towards you know, what started happening in semiconductors, and therefore there is a shortage all over the globe. Uh, where I think we should be proactive is because electric vehicles is the next thing on the anvil, and we know very well that you know, while there is enough material in the Earth's crust, there's not enough mines that are operational right now, so securing that raw material is something where we can be proactive if we look at having electric to the scale that we are talking about, right, so, so to say. But I think coming to tooling, right, uh, one thing, and you know, Mr. Singh is already here, and we know that how over a couple of years, how the automotive component suppliers suddenly became world class in India. It wasn't the case in the 80s. Right? They all have grown. They have grown with the help of the governments as well as the OEMs. Now when we look at the tooling suppliers, the same can be replicated. Only the method to the madness may be slightly different. Here what happens is the OEM has an outsourcing sort of ecosystem. So you're buying one part from the one another from another and you're integrating. I think what the, uh, the tool makers need to do is have a similar thing of, you know, like consortium, you were saying is also being, you know, talked of as an idea, something we've also been talking about for many years now, that uh, a consortium is very important so that you don't do everything in-house. Given your scale, uh, given the, you know, the skill shortage, the shortage of money, you cannot do everything yourself and therefore scalability becomes a challenge. But scaling up in a niche area will not be as challenging. So you take one small aspect of the tooling value chain, you do that, Somebody else does the next, so on and so forth, which is what happens, say, in Japan, happens in Taiwan, right? And then together, as a whole, you become a very competitive industry because each is specializing in that small portion and together you can offer something that is world-class to your customers. And given that you have a domestic demand and even OEMs want this to be localized from a cost perspective, from a coordination perspective, so on and so forth. So clearly the opportunity is there. Those factors were, for example, not there for Taiwan because they don't make as many vehicles okay. there. Hardly any big OEMs there, right? So we have those factors here, but I think here the way to be able to exploit that opportunity will have to be cooperating amongst ourselves. Of course, the support from the government is needed. The government could also play a role in making some of these clusters come together. Uh, sort of shared facilities could be set up which are high in capex and then everybody could utilize those. For example, say specialized heat treatment facilities. Now one player cannot set it up on their own. But, but, but if you set yeah, it up yeah. which everyone can use, a, it can become something much more prudent. Mm -hmm. Similar is about skilling up also. Yes. Right? Then you keep skilling up your people in niche areas, you develop the, uh, the human resource there because as a tool maker you will not be able to be attractive to people across the value chain and retain them also. Right? So the brain drain also happens. So even that can be taken care of if each is specializing in a particular area. Of 
of course, the other elements the government has to look at, wherever there's an inverted duty structure, sorting that out. Tool steel is still an issue, so it, you know something on the logistics and things like that, so that the overall tooling, uh, tool manufacturing time can come down. Those, I think, would be some of the ways by which we can play this game. Mm -hmm. And while China is much bigger, but I think there are many milestones before that also. Yeah. You know, to look at, and uh, I mean, there, there is there is there are so much of opportunity out there that if we even take a few steps in the right direction, we're going to see the fruits of that uh, in the immediate future. Sure, sure. Yes. Then okay. you can give your final yeah. thoughts also on the talk. And yeah. uh, I strongly support uh, Mr. Sharma's view. But the, in making cluster, the leadership by government or an association does not help. It has to be a big brother, <laughs> you know, or the two, uh, all brothers should come together and they should form the consortium. If somebody else take the leadership, then it doesn't work. We have the examples in any way, okay? Yes. Uh, Singh, sir, uh, just on your final thoughts on... No, I'll, I'll just, uh, before the, uh, I just want to give one perspective because, you know, we, we talk a lot. And I think uh, the, whenever we are, uh, and uh, in all, all the talk, I always try to finish with one aspect that let us do it now. Because uh, talking is not going to help us. And uh, I just want to touch one a point which is going to be very critical in coming few years is the digital manufacturing. And uh, whether you talk about the tool manufacturing or uh, overall manufacturing aspects, I'll tell you. And uh, still we are struggling because I had the opportunity to head FIKI for a, quite a long time as for Industry 4.0 is concerned, but uh, I was not happy the way the things were moving. Then finally now I have decided that yes, let me set up a complete uh, industry 4.0 lab in such a way that let's suppose if you are interested tomorrow to come and see how it is to be done at your end and how you are going to drive the benefit. You will have everything A to Z, I'll tell you, go and do it. Because that is important now, because similarly in the skilling side, so both the areas I think uh, what my concept going now is uh, we try to do and so because till and until we talk a lot and a lot of things are being talked again and again and again but somehow things are not going to the ground mm -hmm. because even uh, digital manufacturing I think still we are struggling you know because when you look at uh, industry as a whole some few players are there or maybe uh, maybe hundred or thousand industries are there in India they are trying to adopt but it's still clearly is not there in mind okay, how we are going to drive the benefit how it is to be implemented I'm going to show you that because that is going to be very critical for the industry to come up in future because when we are talking about the world class and the consistency and the quality, things will change only we go in the right direction and do it. That is important. Obviously. Thank you. Obviously. Ravi sir, uh, your thoughts on yeah. the topic? Um, from my perspective, uh, I strongly believe on two points as for the rule making that is I keep strongly believing on this. One, don't bite more than what you can chew. When as a tool maker, when you commit certain things, that is one thing we have to be extremely, that is one thing which makes the cus uh, customers or our people very much, uh, so we have to be very, very careful on that area. Another is, my understanding is most of the tool rooms, I would say not, I would say 80% of the tool rooms, like it's like, you know, jack of all trade, master of none. So I would say this, we are most of the, we are into, put our hands into too many things. Even it take my own case, we have into too many areas. See, it's like, no, we cater to the local industries. Today I do to one segment, the other customer asks for a tool, and everybody we keep making. So we can try and start spending. Every time there is a learning curve, we learn, produce certain tools, then we discontinue, go to another thing, learn, produce, learn a lot of mistakes, then discontinue. That's how it keeps moving from one to one, X to Y, Y to Z. So the, we are not specializing anything. Unless, but my study is most of the overseas tool rooms are other companies who are successful. Even I know few companies in India who, um, who tool rooms were done, focused on specific product, they really made success. See, you have to be catch hold of certain industry or segment of a business, whether it is a packaging or it is a mold making or it's a plastic or it's, even there also you get into a specialization. There are like, they, I know certain tool rooms specialized in only camera parts, or specialized only in lenses. But in India, will you be able to survive with that kind of a specialization? Will you have a continuous business? That is the question. But now, going to the global, instead of, for the sake of surveying, taking every kind of tool and trying to struggle, be specialized and trying to work hard on that area to be specialized so that global customers should come to you. That is the only way we can able to reach global market and get a name niche in our thing. 
Sure, sure. So, thank you, my panel, uh, for taking your time out for discussing on the tool factory of the world. And uh, the key takeaways from this is skill development, uh, working on certain benchmarkings to be done, and being much more focused on their expertise. That is where we should be able to focus our energy. And uh, I would really like to thank you all for joining me in this panel discussion today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Request the panelists to please remain on stage. Um, Mr. Sao, may I please request you join us here. Ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank our panel members. Thank you so much for taking the time out. We have a small memento that we'd like to hand over to each one of you for your time. May I please request uh, Mr. Ankit Sao to hand over the memento to Mr. M.M. M. Singh, Director and CEO, International Automobile Center of Excellence and Executive Advisor, Marty Suzuki, India. Can you please get the memento here? Ladies and gentlemen, please feel free to put your hands together and thank our panelists for joining us here for this incredible session and I'm sure you've had some wonderful takeaways from them. Hand over the memento to Mr. Vivek Nani Vadikar, Executive Director of Fibro India Precision Products Private Limited. <laughs> to Mr. Ashim Sharma, Senior Partner and Group Head Business Performance Improvement Consulting at Nomura Research Institute. <laughs> and to Mr. D. Ravi, Managing Director, CM Precision Product and MD Class Tech Engineering. May I request uh, Mr. Shanmuga Sundaram to please join us on stage and hand over Momento to Mr. Ankit Sahu. And let's thank him for being a moderator for the panel. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. May I request you to please step ahead for the group picture. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us here.